And a year on, um, there's still chatter about the events in the lead up to uh, the Queen's death. It was reported this week that apparently Megan had some sort of insane plan uh, while the Queen <laughs> was on her deathbed and there was some furious correspondence apparently between Charles and, and Harry. Can you fill us in on that? Well, again, I suppose in the intricacies of what was happening in that period, there was so much uh, at play with the fact that the Queen had passed away at Balmoral in Scotland. The royal family were all spread out, <clears throat> trying to scramble up on planes to get to the to the Queen's sides. Some of the the royal family who did obviously manage it, and some that didn't. And interestingly enough, it was Harry's book really here that he set the record straight on this, and that he. He and Meghan wanted to fly up and be by the Queen's bedside. If you remember, the Prince of Wales had travelled with other members of his family, most notably the Wessexes and Prince Andrew, and pretty much well, he left Prince Harry behind. It tells you how strained the relationship was back then. Certainly, it hasn't got any better. And Meghan Markle was going to go with Harry, and it was uh, told to Harry by his father, the King, that, listen... Don't bring Meghan up here. The family uh, obviously don't want her here. That had been how relations had been very, very strained. And uh, I don't think we've seen much improvement over the last year. And, and Harry cut quite a solitary figure on his own when he was at Windsor Castle paying tribute to his late grandmother. And uh, it's a pretty sad state of affairs, I think, all round. Yeah, it, it is a sad state of affairs, and I suppose that takes us on to uh, our next story. Now, a former staffer has claimed that apparently the Sussexes didn't invite the late Queen to Lilibet's first, first birthday, but is that your understanding? No, it's not, to, to, to be honest. And uh, I, I think this has come from this week where we saw Paul Burrell, the former palace staffer, the footman that used to work for the Queen and, uh, you know, likes to spin a yarn or two. But he was saying that the Queen had invited um, Lilibet and obviously Harry and Meghan to a, a party and that she had basically had a cake with a candle in it and that they didn't turn up. But no, I think that when we look at what was happening at that time, and that was when Harry and Meghan were over in London for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee last year, uh, the Queen did actually go to visit Lilibet and the, the Sussex was, was staying at Frogmore Cottage, which was on the grounds of Windsor Castle. And what was the issue was, was about photographs being taken at that uh, moment. And I don't think the Queen wanted to be photographed, especially by a, a professional photographer that Harry and Meghan had enlisted to come along for the day. But certainly the, the, the Queen was, was not about, you know, trying to spoil anyone's fun on the day. She wanted to be a family affair. She was keen to see her great-great-great-grandchild. And, uh, and I think that that tells you an awful lot about the Queen, that she wasn't going to let, you know, family relations deteriorate so much um, despite everything that was happening with Harry and Meghan and their, their want away from the royal family. Yeah, she was always very graceful in that respect, um, regardless of the various bits and pieces that were going on at the time. But there's been another poll out this uh, week again, which so shows that the Brits are no fans of the Sussexes. What exactly did it find? Well, interesting. I mean, there's a, there seems to be a different poll every week. And uh, what happens normally with these polls is that Harry and Meghan have progressively slid further and further and further down the league table, as it were. But some headline figures I, I liked in this poll, it was that 61% uh, of Brits pretty much don't want any uh, Harry and Meghan to have any part within the royal family. I think that says they were saying that they should be Harry should be removed completely from the line of succession. More than two thirds believe that they shouldn't have any taxpayer funding. That relates to the big row that was ongoing due to uh, the Sussexes wanting the, the Met Police in the Scotland Yard in London to pay for their security whenever they were in the country. That remains unresolved. And I think that that is a real issue for Harry when he's going to try and bring his family back over to the UK. We haven't seen Meghan and the children for quite a long time. Uh, and will they will they come back if this situation isn't resolved? I mean, Harry is arguing that the, the British taxpayer should pay for their security funding when they're here. Um, but it's a it's a difficult situation for Harry and uh, it's uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be resolved anytime soon. Now, earlier we talked about this, this idea of, of transition and reflection, and the, the Times has given its assessment on Charles one year down the track, amongst other things, that he looks 10 years younger. Uh, how do you think that they've summarised his year, and what else would you add to it? 
Well, I'm sure he'll be delighted at that uh, summarization by the time saying that the, you know, he looks 10 years longer, younger. I mean, listen, I think that this, this transitional year has obviously come to an end now. That was obviously the mood music and language being used for Buckingham Palace for so long. What are we expecting now? I mean, we've got a, a safe visit to France coming up in a, in a few days. I think that there will definitely be this trip to Kenya in the autumn. And Charles has taken um, his time, I think, to get to grips with the role. I mean, on one sense, you can think that this is something that he must have been planning for for decades, if not his whole life. But I think he really has uh, been surprised with the amount of work that has gone into to being the monarch behind the scenes, the amount of government papers they have to read on a daily basis. And he has taken time to get to the four corners of the UK, meeting with religious and community groups. And I think that that tells you quite a lot about his character. Now, I mean, he's 75 in uh, just a few weeks' time. Camilla is 75 as well. Will they want to be doing the, the huge long tours that they, the royal family are known for? I'm not so sure. So I think there will be a bit of a, a passing of the baton in terms of being doing those long tours. Maybe the Waleses will have to get involved. The Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh as well will be drafted in. And then, of course, Princess Anne, his trusted lieutenant. I mean, she's a remarkable workhorse. So I'm sure that he'll be leaning on her. Uh, for support as well. But overall, I think it's been a pretty a pretty solid year from the King and uh, a chance to sort of kick on now and see what we expect from him to uh, cement his legacy, certainly over the next two to five years, I think. And there's just one uh, piece from the Mirror this week that I found quite interesting, and that was the announcement about the cause of death of the Queen. And apparently that wouldn't have happened if she'd passed away in England. Well, I think it's fascinating, sort of the, again, these details that are coming out still a year later because there was just so much information and, and stories to cover in, in those 10 to 12 days after the Queen had passed away. But because the Queen did pass away in her beloved Balmoral, her death certificate was actually published sort of as a matter of course, and that wouldn't have happened if she had died in England. I, I think that certain journalists would have been able you know, to, uh, to print it as it is a public document. But interestingly enough, that that cause of death of natural causes, um, uh, there would be a questions over the Queen's health for many years. And, you know, luckily she was able to sleep away peacefully at ease with the world. I think we saw uh, some reports this week of one of the reverends who was there with her in her final days, talking about those final conversations that she'd had, very much about her father, very much about her faith, uh, the Church of England, Church of Scotland, and also her role within the Commonwealth as well. That was very, very dear to her. And, uh, and uh, I thought a very interesting insight into the, the Queen's final moments as well. Now, lastly, just before we go, Andrew's still hanging in there. Look, he attended the family memorial service for the Queen. Given it was a private memorial, do you think it was appropriate? Well, it's a difficult situation, isn't it? And I, th I think that if there is any creeping back into the pu public life for Prince Andrew, then a lot of people would find that unpalpable. But again, I think, again, we look back to, to the moment of the, the, the Queen having passed away was not only the uh, you know a monarch leaving this world, but also a family that was grieving as well. And we had to be particularly sensitive to that. And this was a private memorial. This is a man who has lost his mother. And the family sort of still coming to terms with that. I think we saw from uh, William and Kate's statement this week that we all miss you, that there was their, their Twitter message. And speaking to people in, in uh, members of the public in Wales, where they were this week, they were saying, you know, that the, the, the family is still coming to terms with it, I suppose, and, and their new roles with it. But... If Prince Andrew is to, to try and find a way back into public life, I think that that would be uh, very foolhardy. I don't think people would appreciate it. But in terms of him you know, silently continuing to grieve his mother, I, I don't think that uh, anyone can to stand in that way. No, no, I think I, I agree with that sentiment. Anyway, Russell Myers, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you, my pleasure.